Hey guys, it's April and welcome back to my channel. I'm a bachelor's in criminal justice and a minor in psychology and I'm going to say that for the next 69 videos because I'm just so proud of myself. I'm also a board member for a nonprofit, and we really try to help out the family and friends of missing people and we try to give you as much coverage, as much resources as we know to give you. Our big thing right now is billboards. On top of that, we also do search Churches, we have social media presence that we can help with and just things like that. So if you have a missing loved one that you need help with, please get a hold of us and we will do what we can. And as you can tell, my animals are behind me today. Sadie's right here and Jack's a little off camera, but they wanted to join the talking CJ. And today we will be going over a criminologist named Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham is really, really interesting because he started a lot of the steps in the social justice that we see today. So let's just get right in. Jeremy Bentham was born in February 1747 in Houndsditch, London. His father was Jeremiah. Bentham and he was a successful attorney at the time. He really wanted Jeremy to follow his footsteps into law and thought he could be the Lord Chancellor one day. Now his mother was Alicia Woodyard and I couldn't find a whole lot about her and he also had a brother named Samuel Bentham. He did come from a wealthy family and they were the supporters of the Tory party and Jeremy was described as pretty funny and eccentric. Jeremy was pretty much a prodigy the minute he was born. As a toddler, he was found at his dad's desk reading huge books on the history of England. By three, he knew Latin and Greek pretty much fully. And at six, he learned to play the violin. And he would use this to play Handel at dinner parties. He hated dancing, but he did love nature. And he spent hours looking at different plants and trees and really trying to learn about them. He did go to the Westminster School, but at 12, he ended up going to the Queen's College, Oxford. And while he was there, he sat in on a lecture from Sir William Blackstone that actually started making him think about the fact that English laws had a lot of holes in them. He did get his bachelor's degree in 1764 and went on for his master's in 1767. He trained as a lawyer like his dad and he did end up taking the bar in 1769. And at 16 him and his dad went on a trip to France where he really just loved the architecture there. Now while he was alive he had quite a few different positions that he held within society. One was an English professor. He even co-founded the Westminster Review with James James Mill in 1823. And during this time, John Bowring became like a son to him and he mentored him throughout his whole life. And actually, Joe Bowring ended up becoming the editor of the Westminster Review. He also became his personal editor for the things that Jeremy wrote later on. And he also was the leading theorist in the Anglo-American philosophy laws. He was also a jurist for a time but he was mostly known as a social reformer. In his life, he became very frustrated with English law. He did not agree with the state's natural rights at this time, and he called it the devil of chicane. And this is when he pretty much decided to write about the law and how he would change it. He even wrote something called the short review of the Declaration, where he attacked and mocked the American view on politics. And he fought for change for quite a few topics. Secret ballots, prison reform, religion, welfare, international law, animal rights, women's rights, and he fought against the laws against homosexuality. And he was known as the modern father of utilitarianism. He actually never married, but he did fall in love with quite a few women, but to be honest, he just did not know how to show interest. And his way of flirting was trying to teach them how to like, 
play the harp or learn chess. And although that was sweet, that's just not how you courted women back then. Now, he was definitely known as a self-proclaimed atheist, and it is argued that he probably did have Asperger's syndrome. He would also write 10 to 20 pages daily until he was in his 80s. And with the Asperger's and just not really knowing how to socially talk to people as well, it did make him live a pretty private, quiet life especially where he never married or had children. Now, when it came to utilitarianism, he said his biggest inspiration was Joseph Priestley. Jeremy Bentham wanted to form a complete utilitarianism code of law. And the motto he wanted was, the goal is the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. And utility equaled wellness in his mind. So he truly thought if you lived by this code, you would be mentally even the best. And so he truly started to fight for reform in the laws, and especially the areas I mentioned earlier. So he figured the principle of utility should be on a pleasure to pain scale. And he claimed this is what governed all of us. And he really started to dig into the thought that morality and laws should mirror each other. And on the pleasure and pain scale, he would measure it by intensity, duration, certainty, proximity, productiveness, purity, and extent. And he believed in unnecessary laws causing different avenues of danger. And he really dove into the fact that punishments should mirror the crime that is committed and said that too harsh of punishments can cause a whole other world of issues. So his mission in life was to reform the laws of the time. And with this, he coined the phrase to codify, in which he used it as to mean the process to change the legal code. And he mostly fought in England and the United States for change. He wrote President James Madison in 1811. He said that he would even volunteer to write a new legal code for America. And once he realized that the laws in America were mostly state-based, he wrote every governor in America with the same offer. He officially was unsuccessful. None of them really got a hold of him to help, but A for effort. Now, one thing he really wanted was transparency for everyone. That was a big thing he fought for. And he also fought for animal rights, like we talked about a little earlier. He was actually one of the first to fight for animal rights. He truly did believe that animals should only be killed for eating or in defense of a human life. But it was to be fast. It wasn't supposed to be a long, drawn-out death. Something that he wasn't all the way up to speed on was he did believe that it was okay to experiment on animals as long as it would benefit human life. And like I said earlier, another thing he fought a lot for was women's rights. And he actually figured this out at the age of 11 that he wanted to fight for women's rights. He wanted them to be legally the same as men. And he did. He fought for complete complete equality. He fought for women's suffrage, he fought for their right to get a divorce, and he fought for the right for women to hold political office. And another thing that he was huge on was fighting for the rights of your sexuality. He wrote about sexual nonconformity even back then, and he did not believe that sexualities other than being straight were unnatural, which made him argue against the laws against homosexuality. And he was also thought to be the first to write on homosexual reform in England. And one thing that he was very passionate about was prison reform. And he spent 16 years of his life to work on his ideas around prison reform. And his goal was to be a contract governor. He is famously known for his idea of the panopticon, which was inspired by his brother Samuel. And his idea was to have a circular tower in the middle of the prison. That way it was easier to watch everything that happened within it. 
government. And he wrote his father in England about this prison reform idea and how much he thought it would help. And he argued how this would actually be cheaper for prisons because they wouldn't have to have so many people guarding it. And the way he would build this tower within the prison would make it to where prisoners couldn't see the staff and if they were watching them, but the staff could see anybody they wanted to within the prison. He was proposing for this to be built in England, but it was actually never built. But he did have an influence in later generations though. But he never let go that this wasn't built and he truly blamed the king for it. He worked for years on this proposal on the Panopticon and he finally had enough. He wanted this built and he put himself as the contract governor and put his brother Sam as his assistant. He tried to get Ireland and France to build the Panopticon, but both of them never took him up on the offer. So he ended up getting a hold of the Prime Minister, William Pitt, and it did get built in England in Millbank. And in November 1799, he bought some land with government funds for $12,000 for where this prison was going to go. He wasn't happy with the type of land it was going to be built on, but the government was just like, we're not giving you anything better for an experiment. So he dealt with it. And in 1802, the Prime Minister, William Pitt, resigned. And the new Prime Minister, wanted nothing to do with this project at all, which caused Jeremy to be completely devastated. And in 1812 to 1813, the prison was built, and Jeremy Bentham even offered to be the contract governor even at his later age. While he was waiting for the Panopticon to be built, though, he did work for Patrick Callaghan, and he really focused on getting to the bottom of the corruption of the Pole of London, which then caused the depredation of Thames Act of 1800, which created the Thames River Police, which is thought to be the very first preventative police force there was. Now let's talk about the Westminster Review. It was written for the philosophical radicals, and this was for younger people that studied Bentham and his work. His co-founder was James Mill, John Bowring was his editor, and Edwin Chadwick was his secretary. Edwin especially wrote on hygiene, sanitation, and policing, and Edwin Chadwick was a key proponent in the Poor Law Amendment Act. Now Jeremy is too thought to have written up all the way to his death. He died on July 6, 1832, and he was 84 years old. And he died in his home in Queen Square Place in Westminster, London. He did make specific requests for his body that are a little wild. He wanted to be turned into an auto icon, which is a statue of oneself made by his dead body. And he wanted this done for so long that he had glass eyes that he actually carried in his pocket when he was alive that he would bust out at parties as like a funny thing to freak people out. And he had actually made a will at 21 stating this is what he wanted done. He also said to leave his body to George Fordyce, I think is how you say it, which was his friend. It was his physician and he was a chemist. And his daughter had married Samuel. So on May 30th, 1832, he wrote a paper that he attached to his will explaining what he wanted done to him once he had died and how to make an auto icon of himself. And he said to leave this to Thomas Southworth Smith. Now his skeleton and head were preserved and stored in a wooden cabinet. They did fill out the skeleton with a type of material and put Bentham's actual clothes on it. They had tried to mummify his head, but I'm going to be honest, it went wrong. So they ended up making a wax head that looked pretty similar to Jeremy himself. And they ended up using his own hair. In 1833, he was displayed at Southwood Smith's Finbury Square. But in 1849-1850, he was moved to 36 per 
Darcy Street in Margaret Gillies' studio. In March 1850, Jeremy Bentham was offered to Henry Brougham, and he got him for the University College in London. So from 1850 to 2020, he was placed in the main building of this college until a rival school student stole his head. Yes, I said that correctly. Stole his head and held it for ransom. They wanted UCL to donate a hundred pounds to their university and they would return the head. I think they only ended up donating like 50 pounds and got the head back. And the head is now stored in a Victorian bell jar in a wooden box that takes two people and four keys to open. And since 2020, Jeremy was placed in a glass display in the entrance of the new student center of Gordon Square. And they have even removed his body from this display to take him to special events. And he even went to Sir Malcolm Grant's final council meeting in 2013. And that is all I have for Jeremy Bentham. He paved the way in so many massive topics of conversation we're even having today. He was the first to talk about quite a few of these. But thank you guys so much for watching. Like and subscribe for me and hit that notification button. That way you're notified the next time I upload. I still have a GoFundMe running for Crystal Young. If you haven't, go watch that video because you need to know why her mom needs this PI so bad. Top of that, I do have stickers for sale. They're $2 each and all proceeds go to the Cold Case Foundation because it is for a good cause. And again, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!